welcome to my channel, Pen to Paper. Today I am interviewing Jonathan Butcher and Layla Faruqi Hadari, and they are the ones who wrote The Legend of the Amberstone, a Persian fairy tale, which I read for the Indie Readathon in July. So, welcome, Jonathan and Layla. Nice to have you here. Hi. So, the Hi, first, oh, great. I'm, I'm doing really well. I'm so excited to just talk with you guys and about your work and put your work out there for everyone else to read and to look into. And uh, it's a great start to your collaboration future. <laughs> Is there going to be another collaboration? But we'll get back to that question later. So the first question I have is, how did you guys come up with this idea? How did the process begin? How did you get together as collaborators? Jonathan, you go about how we came by, and then I respond to this first question. <laughs> okay, so if people, if you are wondering why Jonathan has a different background, it's because we just had a bunch of technical issues and he had to switch to his iPad. So now they're going to answer the first question. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so the first question is about uh, basically. Um, how the project came to be. So Layla and I have been friends for a long time and colleagues actually, we used to work for the same company. And um, we did, so, I, I was in Montreal, she was in Toronto and we did a bit of traveling back and forth uh, for projects that we were working on. And over that, you know, uh, time, my friendship grew, you know, when we were in one city or the other, we'd go out for dinner and we talk about things in general. And we discovered that we had um, an interest in, you know, culture and cuisine and literature and things like that. And so just through um, talking, Layla expressed at one point about, um, you know, from her uh, Persian background, a desire to share some of, some of the culture and the stories and things like that with people. <clears throat> and um, especially um, uh, sort of Iranians no longer in Iran, but like in Canada and with their kids growing up, Layla has two kids and she can tell you about that. She wanted, you know, the, 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 some of the traditions or whatever not to be lost. And um, uh, because of some of the work I was doing at the time, I was involved with a lot of communications and whatever. And she said to me, well, I can tell the stories, but maybe I don't write as well as you. Would you write them down and we'll collaborate that way? And so that's kind of how it came to be. She would basically tell me, uh, you know, different elements of the story, whatever, and I would write them down and then we would review the text together. And it sort of just developed like that. And at first it was just, it was something that we did for fun. And then later decided that we wanted to go ahead and, you know, make it into an official book and publish it. Mm. I love that concept of keeping. Sorry, that's my kid. <laughs> that's <all> that <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay, go to the house. I'll be there soonish. <laughs> Uh, I love that concept of keeping the traditions alive and making sure that your kids know where you come from and where, you know, their nationality is and where your people's in generation come in general, sorry, come from. So that's a, that's a wonderful sentiment. So, yeah. And then you asked the question uh, that uh, how we came by the projects and I have to tell you, uh, Persian uh, Persians have Iranians have lots of fairy tales, but none of them are written. They are all uh, told through mother to kids, and then and the um, bedtime stories and such. Or there are storytellers that would go to from village to village, and they had these paintings of the story and they would sit around the fire and they, they, they were telling the story. So um, when we thought that, uh, and I said, we have lots of these stories. They were, none of them were documented. Few years back, two gentlemen, two, two Iranians, uh, Iranian gentlemen, one um, Ali Ashab Darvish and the other one, uh, Reza, they started to gather all these stories. They went village to village and they put them together. So for each story, there are about uh, four or five versions of the story. And um, when Jonathan and I uh, started to talk, 
I, we thought at first to translate some of them and we started to read, I started to read and pick uh, this particular story, the story of Norinj and Toranj, I really loved it as a kid. So there are a few versions and we, um, when, I, when we looked at it, we realized that, um, well, the story starts when the prince comes to the door of a, a, an orange orchard and he starts to do this. And uh, actually it was my husband, he said, when we started to write, he said, where did he come from? And then Jonathan and I thought, yeah. So we started from the beginning, we created their background up to the time that the prince gets to the door of the orange orchard. We took basically, because each story has about uh, three, four pages of story. It is not a whole story. So we took three elements of the original story, which one was the orange orchard and the girl who comes out. Another one was uh, that uh, and the prince brings the, uh, brings the oranges out. And this is this slave, ugly slave girl who sees the prince coming, goes to, uh, to the top of the tree and sees this. And it's the prince, when the uh, princess comes out or the girl comes out, they don't have names in their original story. She's nude. And he said, I cannot take you to town like this. Let me go get you clothing. And that um, slave girl comes down and kills the girl because all stories were very cruel. They, they were very like in, into your face. So um, kills it and she replaces her. And uh, the last part was um, where she was killed. There was a tree, there was a tree. And then an old woman uh, sees the lumberjacker and says, oh, can, can you make me a spindle? And this is how. So these three elements we got and we had a 14 chapters uh, story of, of it. So we just got the three elements. On top of that, we got the elements of uh, storytelling. Like we spoke as if somebody has the children in front of them and telling them the story. And we found out that uh, so many people liked it. The, the people who read it, they said, okay, it is as if somebody is telling. So you see that in the middle of the story, it is cut sometimes. And uh, directly, it is like the Brecht. The, I don't know if you know Brecht theater. So it is the pointing, like they are doing the acting and then they go to the audience, they talk and they continue. It is like like uh, Mother Courage or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Kind of like they do in movies sometimes and not often, but you know, they'll break what they call the fourth window, right? And they'll yeah. address the audience yeah. directly. Yeah. So that was, a, I mean, that was an interactive way as, you know, these storytellers, old nomadic storytellers are going around and telling stories, but they always wanted to keep the audience interested and engaged, right? And sometimes they would, you know, address them directly or point them out or, or or, or interrupt in order to make a point or something, you know? So we wanted to preserve a little bit of that kind of tradition in, in the writing. So um, yeah, and, and you'll, you'll notice it. In fact, I think you commented on it later that sometimes you found it maybe almost distracting sometimes, right? When we would break the narrative and, and speak out directly, but that was intentional. Like that's part of what we wanted to sort of imitate, I guess, in the oral uh, you know, tradition of storytelling. Yes, yeah. Well, I really did feel there was definitely a magic to it in the sense that I really did feel like someone was speaking to me or there was a storyteller in front of me and telling me this Thank you. fairy tale. Um, that magic, I think you guys did the closest that I would think to like an actual person telling me the story. It was very close okay. to that. So that was really well done. And that's, I loved that, um, Kind of, it had this such magical innocence, naivety to it, but yet it's dealing with such um, harder subjects too. Like, right, she she yeah. dies, and then there's all these, you know, there's deceit and betrayal. But it was done, mm -hmm. in, it was so light at the same time, so it was very palatable. <laughs> you could you. You could ingest it and and still really enjoy it. But I know it sounds very strange, but. It but it's true, even there are other there are other fairy tales actually that over the years you can see they've been toned down. Um, 
uh, is it the story of Cinderella where mm. uh, I think like it, it can they're very violent like if you look at the original versions they're actually quite violent yes. so over the years I mean they've you know in order to make them more kid-friendly and actual fairy tale and light-hearted and happy ending you know some of these more uh, violent elements have been either toned down or removed right so that happened in ours as well because like Layla mentioned you know at one point it's an outright slaughter of like the slave girls <laughs> you know what I mean yeah and it's it's her blood basically that you know makes the tree grow up but we didn't want to get into all of those details <laughs> and the, the point we were really trying to make was you can't keep amber down right like she gets mm -hmm. in prison she gets released you know she gets buried alive actually but you know she comes back you know all of these things that are happening to her um you know but basically it's it's good winning out in the end right so yeah that's right <laughs> and i did i have a kind of a little bit off onto a tangent you were mentioning Layla that you know mothers pass down these stories to their children do you find that um Iranian families do that today like is that something that parents do mm, no yeah, because as much? Um, like, like Canadian families American families French families, where parents work and uh, it is if it is a bedtime story they read it off of a book yeah they do not create stories as or they do not pass it on because um, so many uh, children today Iranian children they don't know this story mm -hmm. this is what Jonathan mentioned before this my my and um I sometimes uh, would I I read them Dr. Seuss for all it matters or uh we're in the same family so um Except uh, for last uh, last uh, winter, that something else happened unrelated to our story. But uh, my own daughters have not uh, heard about this story. So this is what I th uh, thought, and I discussed it with Jonathan, and Jonathan um, was like, he's, he's my partner in crime, and uh, we wrote it for children who do not read. Uh, most uh, Iranian children, it is 40 years that um, Iranians started to migrate. And um, if they are in France, if they are in uh, US, uh, North America, they speak Persian, but they don't read it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it is like so many Spanish children that I have noticed that they speak Spanish, but they do not really know how to write. So. This is how it is. I think you guys have actually hit um, on a gold mine, uh, really, because you have taken the traditional stories from Iran and you're meshing them with, you know, this new uh, culture and country that Iranians have had to um, kind of Im immerse themselves in. And so you're putting the mm -hmm. two together in a way that, you know, kids can, can actually find out about their heritage. But in a way that, you know, how media is consumed today by movies and TVs and books. So you guys have hit into yeah. that, uh, that book field, which is really great. So I'm just curious. Uh, well, you kind of touched a little bit on it uh, already, but I was wondering if the book was a faithful adaptation of the traditional legend. And did you kind of use a little bit of creative license to flesh out the book, which you said you already kind of took the three main elements of the orange tree and Amber dying and she becoming an orange tree. Um, what, were there any other creative licenses that you took to make this your own a little bit or did you kind of just stick with the original? It is all our own and because Jonathan, you can respond to back because he is, uh, I knew the uh, story, but it is apart from that three elements, which is, the backbone of the original story. Yeah. Nothing else uh, belongs to that story. As okay. you said, we brought it to today. We created a background and the foreground. So, Jonathan, what do you think? Yeah, exactly. I think so. Leila's husband, his name is Beirus, and he was sort of, um, you know, involved a little bit in the process, just, you know, asking questions and challenging us a little bit, right? And I mean, if when you think that the story starts in the orange orchard with him, you know, taking the knife to open the orange and, and free basically Amber's spirit. So then like the question is, okay, but who is he? And where did he come from? And how did he get there? And how did she get there? You know, so it's all the whole backstory, the first few chapters that are leading up to this 
you know, imprisonment in the orange and whatever, how, how it all came to be. And that's not in the original legend. That's that that's something that we kind of like came up with on our own, fabricated in order to get them to that point where we could, you know, continue to weave in the other um, three, like all three of the main elements of, of the story. But like Leila mentioned, each each of those segments is only about three or four pages in in sort of the original um, storytelling, right? Yeah. So our book is fourteen chapters. We had quite a bit, you know, to sort of add in there. And we didn't set out to write 14 chapters. We set out to, you know, provide a full story, you know, in, in sort of modern um, um, uh, fairy tale writing or whatever, like write modern novel form mm -hmm. um, and make sure that they were all covered, but also that it would flow properly as well, because we didn't want it to feel like, you know, too rushed or, or, or you know, that things were skipped or whatever. We wanted to go into that detail. But those details were basically the inventions of our own imagination. Well, that's really impressive. I also, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, I, I have, I just remembered that we took, a, actually, Jonathan um, suggested this. And you, he, you see a couple of short stories, very short stories, four or five, uh, like, um, sentences in the story and it, they are they are also the original Persian stories like um the um it, it, at the beginning we say um how a how can a person take a cow on the shoulder and go up ask a Persian old uh, old person uh, this is an actual Persian story and it is based on or when the they go to uh to the ship and they uh, do the thing that is it is a very, I think it is a one uh, paragraph or two, and, but it is an original. And then um, the tradition of Persian New Year and what we do. And, and actually, Jonathan forced me to write it myself. Oh. Because, <laughs> yeah, the, how, how uh, the Persian uh, New Year happens and what are the symbols and everything. We brought it in, so we made it Persian. But it is we hope to introduce this culture to other cultures too. So, and part of it, Leia too, is that I mean, having known Leila, got getting to know her professionally, and then you know, slowly over time, personally becoming friends and knowing her family and everything. There were things that she would say, which obviously are not in my culture or tradition, right? Little sayings or expressions or whatever. Uh, you know, and so we found a way to sort of weave some of those in and then make reference. And I think you'll, you may remember at one point we even say, um, you know, I'm reminding you about this and this and this. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go ask an old Persian because they'll tell you. Yeah. And, and these are, these are very, very common references within the Persian culture that they all understand. Right. And Layla will tell me one word sometimes and to be honest, and then kill herself laughing. I'm like, I don't get it. What's so funny. And she tells me the whole backstory behind that. And then all of a sudden it's like, ah, if it, one whole scenario, like of a joke, whatever, is boiled down to one word or a very short expression. One that wow. we didn't include is about eating your yogurt. And it's not 100% appropriate for kids, which is why we didn't put it in. But just, you know, like, and, and I have even said that to her now sometimes. We will be in a discussion. I'm like, Layla, just eat your yogurt. And she knows what I mean. It, it basically means drop it, like move on and, and we'll talk about it another time or we won't <laughs> talk about it at all because it's not important, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I don't know if kids are going to watch this, but I think it would be fun for you to know what the background of that is, if you don't mind me telling. I would love about to. The yogurt. Yes, please. Yeah. So, and Layla, you'll correct me if I get it wrong, right? Yes. But so at one point, there's this, you know, husband and wife, and they've got kids and whatever. And then he's called away. Um, I guess he goes to war. or He goes on a long, long business trip. And when he comes back, he looks and there are two more kids, two more babies there that he that were not there when he left. <laughs> and he said, uh, and he says to his wife, I don't understand. Where did these kids come from? And she said, well, we didn't know it at the time. But when you left, I was pregnant. So, you know, that's where this one came from. And he says, OK, but what about the second one? <laughs> and the wife says, look at him. He's eating his yogurt. Let it be. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> the epitome of inside jokes. Go eat your yeah. yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So when I when I hear about stuff like that, and there are many, many, you know, um, references like that, and Layla is very patient in explaining them to me in a way that I, as a non-Persian, you know, can understand. But yes, it's it's very rich and uh, um, um, 
what do you call it? Like with a lot of imagery and whatever that conjures up these uh, the, these other scenarios or or whatever that you can relate to once you know what the reference actually is. That's true. Wow, I I might start using now that now. Go eat your yogurt. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna start using it with my mom because my mom. <laughs> my mom uh, she's kind of we're opposites in a lot of ways but we're similar in, in different ways too she just tends to worry more than I do and I'm just like relax and I'll just be like go eat your yogurt <laughs> yeah. well yeah I, on the on the flip side you can say what have you done well, I was eating my yogurt there you go like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yeah. that's great yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you for sharing that with me. I love the intricacies of other cultures and just, you know, learning the little details because the little details is what brings, um, you know, books to life like this and just scenarios, as you said. So that's, uh, that's all really great. And part of it was like, you know, you, you, we always talk about like Persian carpets and things like that, right? And there are, you know, tapestries that are, you know, very intric intricately woven, you know, works of art and whatever. And we try to put like in the story, these little elements that hopefully someone who's reading it, you know, and, and paying attention will say, I'm not sure what that means. And will like, inspire this curiosity to go find out, you know, yeah. and, um, and then learn more about, you know, the culture and the Iranian background from from those little hints right yeah and and if you're not like if it's too subtle that's fine it doesn't take anything away from the story but if you notice it and you go digging after it you end up finding something you know very interesting and quite rich that's right no i that's that's really cool um let's go back a little bit to the process of how you guys collaborated so you already mentioned that uh, you would get together and then you would write jonathan and then layla said that you got her to write a little piece there um <laughs> So, I mean, I, I already know this answer, but for those, of, you know, who are going to be watching, don't know how long did this all come together? Like, how long did it take to get this whole process together and, you know, rewrites and edits and beta readers or whatever you guys use? How did this all happen? Okay, I can answer a little bit about that. Sure. And then Jonathan can continue on his part. The part that uh, we started with, we worked on projects, like uh, as Jonathan said. And uh, I had uh, this thing about the pro project that I put everything on bullet points. Like whatever thought I had on, on a project, I would put it as a bullet point. And then we would expand the, I would expand the bullet point. Like he went there, okay, where did he go he, and whatnot. And then Jonathan and I, would uh, read this and expand each bullet point to a bigger one. And then Jonathan is on you. You can continue. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Leah, for your information, as far as like the logistics, um, I, I eventually, like before we actually started this project, I actually had moved back to Toronto. So we were in the same city, same office. Oh, and we decided awesome. to do was in order to, um, you know, because we talked about it for quite a while. And, you know, we, we had these ideas on how do we um, progress or progress. And what we decided to do was actually meet every Saturday for a couple of hours in the morning. So we got together either at a restaurant or eventually Layla had an office that she was working out of that had a little kitchenette. So we would actually go and cook a little breakfast there. Nice. And as we were eating, then we would talk and, and, you know, share ideas. And it came to be that we would talk. Um, she would show bullet points. We would discuss them, whatever. Sometimes she would tell me or retell me the story. And then, um, you know, I would I would start to write things down and then she would leave and go about, you know, her family business and things like that. I would stay for a little while and continue to write. And then when we came back the next week, we would review what I had written, make sure that everything, you know, lined up to, you know, basically what her vision was, that the content was accurate, whatever. Um, and, and, and we sort of like self-edited and self-challenged and, you know, had quite a few discussions about, no, it shouldn't be said this way. Yes, it should be said that way, whatever. And we did that process for about a full year. It was just about one full year. So about 52 Saturdays we met in order to, uh, to get this work done. But it was a lot of like documenting point, note, uh, bullet points, like she said, um, you know, filling it out, fleshing it out, writing, reviewing, and then carrying on uh, the following week. Mm. Okay. And how did the editing go? So it, how long did it take to write the book? 
So you said the year, right? Uh, yeah, about 52. And then yeah. The editing and going back and fixing things. How long did that? So, if I, so we we did some self editing and like I said, we did a lot of challenging between ourselves. And then we thought, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to publish it? And this is, I mean, to both of our chagrin, it sat for about 12 years. And we talked about it and talked about it and thought, oh, we should send it here. We should send it there. Amazon has this writing contest, this other thing. Like there's all these like, uh, you know, places where you can submit it, whatever. It always seemed like we just missed the deadline by like two days or something like that. It was very <laughs> frustrating. And then I forget what year it was. And Layla finally said to me, Jonathan, you know what? I'm tired of this. Either we do something or we throw it in the garbage because I'm tired of torturing myself with the, you know, the prospect, the prospect that could be something. Mm. And so um, we got a friend of ours, in fact, a mutual friend, you know her as well, uh, Anne Hussapian, yeah. who's a professional editor. She, she had been like, we're in a writing group together. And so we talked about the project a little bit and she was very encouraging from that point of view. But we finally decided why not engage her professionally to do a full on edit, a proper edit. And she did it. And um, we decided at the beginning that regardless of what she said, we were gonna trust her, right? Because obviously if we're asking for a professional advice, you know, we wanna take it, right? We can't stay emotionally attached to something. There was only one point that she suggested that we didn't agree and we ended up keeping it the way it was. Everything else, if she said it, we, we did it, right? So, and we felt very good about that. Like I've known Anne for a long time. So obviously trust her and, and whatever. And, and she has the experience behind her. Um, and so then um, after that, we decided to how, well, we were discussing how we were gonna um, publish it. But one of the things that was in our way is that we wanted to include illustrations mm -hmm. and we didn't know where to go. So we tried to like, we took some public stock photos and we Photoshopped them and we did all this kind of stuff. And then we thought, no, we'd really like to have some original artwork. So another coincidence, Layla's daughter was looking for someone to collaborate on a project with. Someone that I went to high school with had now had her own business that did that very thing. And so I introduced the two of them, right? So then one thing kind of led to another. And I thought, oh, if my friend can do this for Layla's daughter, maybe she can do our illustrations for us. So I went to her professional website for the first time, a professional website, because we'd always just chatted through Facebook or whatever. And what I landed on in her on her homepage was, have you written a book that you'd like to publish? I can help you with that. Oh, I had no idea she did that, right? Oh, wow. So we actually hired her to do the illustrations, which were was one sort of separate project, and then to take on the um, independent publishing as well under, well, we put our, we have a little publishing house name, and we use hers as well. It's through the Amazon platform, but basically it has both our names on it, Rebel Spirit and, um, and uh, ICANN Media. Nice. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and so she handled basically all of the, uh, the logistics after that, as far as, you know, the sizing and the, the, the color of the cover and, you know, the formatting and all that kind of stuff. She handled all of that for us and then ended up giving us basically two proof copies. And they say proof copy right across them, right? To make sure that as you read through it, it's in the right format and everything. And it was perfect. So we went ahead with it and, and, uh, and, and published it. Well, very smart on your end for getting someone else to do the formatting. <laughs> yeah. I, might, I might completely do that with my next, uh, my, my upcoming works because formatting is the one thing I absolutely hate. <laughs> that's the only thing mm -hmm. I hate in this whole process but um and it can make a big difference it right? well. if, it, if it's done wrong it can make a big difference and that can be a big distraction in itself too right so yeah. knowing that someone is going to take on that task for us and we didn't have to and I mean this she does this for a living so obviously she knows what she's doing right we would have probably spent another 12 years trying to get it formatted so <laughs> no you guys did it well you guys you know hired um outside experienced people to help you bring this project together and I have to say the illustrations were spot on like I felt uh captured by the magic of your words but also I felt the illustrations really mixed well and had that Persian feel to them so um well done with that yeah yeah and then we we entered these uh, publishing houses that for the libraries around Ontario okay. that uh, they take from that. But uh, unfortunately, COVID happened and the libraries were shut down. So the next step is to send it to the libraries and um, 
Well, that's kind of what Very I'm going to go in with uh, my next question is what are your expectations for this work? Like, how, what are your dreams? How far do you want it to go? That type of thing. As, uh, yeah, as Jonathan said, uh, this is because I want the book be read by uh, different people, different cultures, especially Iranian backgrounds, to know the story that exists there. Um, I really like a Disney, Disney movie, but I we don't know anybody, so we are not going to, but because when Jonathan and I were talking, it was all visual. We just envisioned it and wrote, uh, wrote it down. But as I really like people to read it and enjoy it mm. because um, this is special children. So this is this is what I we really really I really really wish so. Yeah, and in the in the forward layer, we actually mentioned sort of where the project came from. We talked about Leila's wish to share the Iranian culture and, and some of the background and whatever Persian um, history and everything with, with, I mean, with, with anybody basically, right? Especially you know Persians living outside of Canada who may be a little bit disconnected from their their um, heritage and background. Um, but I mean, yeah, we 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 believe that it could be um, you know a, a, a good story that's enjoyed by anybody. Um, if we really want to dream big, I mean, we would love to see it turned into a movie, maybe an animated something or, you know, uh, um, I'm also thinking like, it would be nice to have a, a dramatized version. And I don't know if you know, um, the Chronicles of Narnia that, you know, the BBC did with focus on the family. It's yeah. a really, really great production. Lots of sound effects, different voices, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I think that could be kind of cool as well. Um, anyway, we did we did submit it actually to Tailflick. I don't know if you've heard of that site. Yeah, but you, you, you showed me yeah. uh, the link. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so we actually made it um, to the semifinal round, and we weren't selected at the end, which was kind of disappointing. But whatever. I mean, just the fact that that it was considered and it got as far as it did, and some of the feedback we got from that panel of um, evaluators, it was really really positive. You know, so that's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. So we won't give up if we weren't successful this time around. We'll try again, or we'll 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 keep that dream alive somehow as we pursue other options. I think getting it into libraries would be really the next step, and especially in Toronto, there's a large um, Persian culture um, or community in Toronto. So um, there's been a, a very positive initial reaction from the library circuit there. Um, so it's just a question of going ahead and, and and sort of like you know continuing to to offer it and knock on the doors or whatever and, and take the opportunity as it comes. We had a few other events like book signing or whatever, but all of it unfortunately was canceled due to COVID. So yeah. when this vague wave passes, hopefully maybe we can, you know, rejuvenate some of those ideas too. For sure. Well, that's all really exciting, guys, and wishing you all the best with uh, that, just getting the word out there. And hopefully Thank this video will help propel that as well. And um, last question I have for you guys is. Uh, can we expect any more future collaborations between the two of you? More Persian fairy tales or? <laughs> well, um, there, is a, there is one story coming up and uh, it is uh, happened last winter. My younger, young, younger daughter, she was not feeling not well. And I started to tell her to and retell her the story, a story. And then, uh, it has the bones. We I, we have discussed it with Jonathan. We have not yet started. It is in the bullet point uh, um, um, stage. And also there is a, there is a screenplay that uh, we are writing, but the story is not ours. It is my husband's. It's the screenplay that we are writing actually, and it is being finished oh wow right? it is my my husband does my husband made a, a wants to make him he, his job his a short film and now for a longer film it is a, a sto story it is a screenplay that we are writing and we are finishing okay so yeah, and it's not it's not like a Persian culture story or whatever. It's a uh, it's sort of a modern day tale about whatever a, a, a single father that gets into a little bit of um, 
um, health trouble, I guess you could say, like nothing legal wise or whatever, but, um, you know, just the, the struggles that, you know, you go through, as, you know, trying to raise a kid that has some, um, you know, difficulties and whatever, and, and the whole, the, the life that he has, it's quite bleak and barren actually. And, you know, um, yeah. Uh, and then the other one that Layla mentioned, yeah, it will be another, uh, fairy tale in the same kind of vein as the Amberstone legend, um, but more details to come about that. Like Layla said, it's very still much in the conceptualization stage. So we'd like to do something with that as well. She told she's told me again the same kind of thing of like you know telling me you know bits and pieces and, and whatever. So it, it reminds me kind of of how we started on the first book. It's kind of the same process again that we'll probably end up going through, but hopefully we'll be a little faster the second time around. Yeah. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> and not let it sit around for 12 years. Yeah, for 12 years. Gotta bring it, guys, because I'm looking forward to this new story. <laughs> you Thank have you. to be like uh, the 1001 Arabian Nights or something, right? You have to give us like oh, yeah. stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, this has been really great, guys. Thanks for um, coming on the call with me and uh, yeah, talking about your work and how you want to enrich the lives of young Persian people and just for heritages and for any nationality people doing this type of work I think it's so important uh, just to remember the past because the past is uh, exactly enriches our lives and it helps us um, live more brightly in the present I think so yeah. this is really amazing so thanks well, guys. We really thank you so much for having us yeah yeah we really appreciate the invitation this was a nice surprise Leah I wasn't expecting that actually but it's 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 great of you to allow us to come on and talk a little bit about uh, about our project thank you yeah well you know I, I am uh, in, 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 in the, <laughs> I'm an indie author myself right and this is why I put my, together my channel um you know to help writers but also not um yeah, to help writers know how to write the craft, but also to help you guys market your work too and just promote indie authors. And it's funny because I never really used to read indie work. And then I got into this whole um, book reviewer community who are major proponents of indie authors and wanting to help support them. I was like, yeah, why am I not doing this? <laughs> so I guess it's just an idea that didn't come into my head. And all my friends have been just encouraging me and by example to do that so it's very exciting for sure yeah. 